I, I lost $97,000 because of you. I bankrupt because of you. Look. Yes, so yes, yes. You, know you keep changing every day. What have you I, keep, you what keep changing every day. Hold on a second. Day. What have I changed about black? Huh? What have you I changed, changed the whole business. What? what? You dropped the prices. On, on black? Yes, you did. Bullshit. We started with $20. Bullshit. We started with $20. You know what? How much is the mile now? $275? You know what? What? Some people don't like to take responsibility for I their take shit. Responsibility. They blame everything but in their life on somebody else. But why you email for town card? Good luck. Ah, yes. This story. The 2010s saw a distinct trend. A wave of classical industries were digitized upon a new internet platform. Their success came after they achieved a network effect that attracted an influx of venture capital investment that then unleashed a cascade of unintended consequences. The age of internet middlemen had begun, and after a decade of doing business with these types of platforms, we still have yet to ask the most important question of them all. Who really is better off because of them? There are continued questions about how sustainable this on-demand food delivery model can be. It strikes me that Uber, at the end of the day, is like is literally ground zero for income inequality, that it's figured out a way to have this two-class system. Median wages haven't budged in 40 years, and we haven't created full-time jobs in a decade. We create these part-time, contingent, flexible jobs. Work has come apart, and income inequality is only getting worse. It's The internet giants we know today all came from humble beginnings. In our example of Uber, it began with only a few employees, but their biggest challenge was teaching both consumers and drivers to act in an entirely new way. Riders had been hailing cars for more than a century, but no one had done so by just using an app. This was the perfect situation that only money could solve. Uber received this money by convincing investors that they were different, as they were able to showcase they had the potential to scale exponentially. By taking this money, Uber put many new drivers on the road, which meant customers had a new, convenient transportation option that was, at the time, very affordable. Repeat this process over years and the platform creates a network effect, increasing both adoption and demand within the platform. This process was replicated across many platforms, from Airbnb to Upwork and digitizing age-old industries was so effective that they seemingly carved out new markets for themselves, which gave them full control of their users' behavior. But this dynamic eventually had to come into balance. Soon, Uber's investors wanted to see their return, which meant Uber was no longer so generous to the drivers. This is complicated, but it can be visualized by one simple graph. I give you the S-curve. As any new platform launches, Consumers get an affordable or even free product, and in the case of Uber, workers were decently compensated in the beginning. This enabled user adoption to skyrocket, but as time went on, drivers' earnings began to drop as investors' demands extracted more from the platform. These shareholder-owned networks eventually see a war between two parties take place, putting the platform at a crossroads. Do they continue to cooperate with their users or begin to give returns to their original investors? Now, long term across many platforms, this has led to more ads on Facebook, higher fees on Airbnb, and more money taken from your freelance gig on Upwork. And with these types of market forces playing out, one truth has always remained through hundreds of years of capitalism, and that is the customer gets what the customer wants. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads us to an important question. Is there a way for these types of platforms to commit to continued cooperation without sacrificing their users' experience over their investors? Deep in the Rocky Mountains, there's someone hiking along a trail wearing a sustainably sourced jacket made from the little brand known as Recreational Equipment, Inc. REI was born as a co-op and has developed into a massive community controlled by its members. The power of a co-op is that they are owned and operated by its members, giving them the capability to decide the values of the enterprise. This democratic style of ownership has led to what many retail brands would deem as unthinkable. As a co-op, REI still grosses $3 billion a year, but it also refuses to take part in the most important day in shopping, Black Friday. 
The members and employees believed the holidays were for outdoors, not shopping, and voted to opt out and close their stores. Now, is this bad business or is it ethical capitalism? This co-op structure may work for a company that sells outdoor camping gear, but can it be applied to internet companies that have been dictated by models of short-term profits, sucking up maximum investment, and, you know, moving fast and literally breaking things? Luckily for us, just over a decade ago, a solution was found that can challenge platforms and their extractive nature. It was a new protocol development that let us distribute value across the internet without needing a central operator or middleman controlling these networks. And it turns out blockchain technology gave us more than just funny memes. Entrepreneur and investor of Variant Fund, Jesse Walden explains how this breakthrough will impact the construction of internet platforms in the future. Now that we have this means of distributing value at internet scale in, in very granular transmissions, and, and that is, you know, the technology breakthrough of tokens, it's it's no wonder that users are going to take the next step and start to contribute to platforms in deeper ways. It's not just going to be open source code or, you know, content or products. It's going to be actual operations of the platform itself. And that's what you see in Bitcoin. That's what you see in Ethereum. It's what you're going to start to see across many more consumer facing marketplaces and networks. Um, and if you do, if, if this does play out, and it, it already is, um, it means that the cost to building these networks drops dramatically because no longer are you hiring people into a company. Instead, you're outsourcing the work or you're crowdsourcing the work from users who earn a direct stake in the platform value for, for their contribution. Um, and that's just a much more efficient model, both both economically, you know, in terms of financial capital and, and production capital, um, than, than sort of the corporate model where you have to raise ton, tons of value and you can only sort of tap into the talent pool of people that, that are willing to, you know, or, or are allowed to work at your company and earn equity investments. So that's another reason that I think these, these networks can be more valuable due to their sort of efficiency gains. Still confused? Let's look at a company achieving this so-called token strategy. Braintrust connects tech freelancers and companies looking to hire them. Unlike Upwork and other talent marketplaces, Braintrust is set up as a nonprofit, charges a nominal fee to the companies looking to hire freelancers, and meanwhile, the freelancers keep 100% of their earnings and additionally get a say in the future of the network. Now, how is this possible? The users, both the freelancers and companies, gather tokens from Braintrust, allowing them to vote on the future of the network. Over time, the users can decide which categories of work Braintrust should include, what the platform fee should be, or the rules of the platform, and other network governance topics. Now this should lead us to ponder, how can other talent marketplaces like Upwork and others even compete with this model? Simple answer, they can't. With the distribution of tokens to its users, Braintrust takes on a public goods ownership structure that allows the users to remain in control of the network, which means they can potentially grow larger and stay aligned with their users in the long run, instead of traditional internet platforms that have been hoarding their profits at the top while extracting so much from their users down below. <laughs> With this breakthrough, we've been presented the first real opportunity to slow the large networks who have exacerbated inequality. By distributing ownership and governance of internet platforms, we can open up the potential for a more equitable future to millions across the globe. As the world continues to be more nomadic and borders are crossed with bits instead of bodies, these platforms give us the chance to earn more and work on projects that leave us more fulfilled. By taking back our power from those at the top, the platforms and networks can once again create a new path for society. A path that points us to more opportunity and ultimately more happiness.